Well, 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 it's Saturday the 26th of November. This is episode 2242 of 301 Permanently Moved Online, a personal podcast 301 seconds in length, written, recorded and edited by me, at the JMO. If you're listening in the UK, the online safety bill goes before the House of Commons next week. Tabloid headlines are focusing on putting people who take upskirt pics in jail. But the reality is much more concerning. Amongst other things, it seeks to remove GDPR protections and ban end-to-end encryption. I'll link to some articles in the show notes, but I urge you to write to your MP this weekend and tell them what a disaster this legislation is going to be. Anyways, as long as you're not a Twitter user, it has been, all things considered, a pretty good week on the internet. Tumblr and TikTok have blessed us with the Gronchorov movie and the Doubloons RPG. I was going to talk about it, but several people have asked me to. I'm a narrative strategist and work in the emerging field of world running, so here I am. I'm not going to describe each of these cultural phenomena, links in the show notes. Instead, I'll provide some commentary. For context, I refer you all back to episodes 2133 and 2134 on collective storytelling and power fandoms. Also, my post on Craven Cannon, it's been interesting to see how normie media have covered both cultural phenomena, treating them with a sort of kooky, look at what's going on over here on the internet, side eye. In reality, there's very little difference between Tumblr conjuring an imaginary Martin Scorsese movie into existence and TikTok zoomers convincing boomers that they were eating Tide Pods. Nor is Goncharov anywhere near as interesting as some of the narratives QAnon have conjured into existence. Difference being, in the mind of Q followers, some of these narratives have become real. To my mind, Goncharov is another signal that the media environment of cultural fracking and mythic commodity trading is well e coyote over the cliff. Some of the best analysis about it all, of course, has come from Tumblr itself. I reblogged this one last week. When asked their thoughts on the Goncharov meme, at Comic Aura replied, Tumblr has gotten so good at constructing fandoms completely divorced from any source material that they've finally cut out the middleman and just started making shit up. Echoing my Craving Canon essay, at MRV3000 said, By media companies making the story more and more exclusive and inaccessible to more and more people, fandom will turn to things in the public domain or even make up their own story in order to have fun where anyone can join in. Despite its low cultural status, fandom is a mode of cultural production that sits at the very core of the internet's psyche. Its participatory culture, or rather customs of cultural production, are older than the internet itself. Fandom is deeply ingrained into our collective cultural subconscious. Drawing on the work of Stanley Fish, 1980, in the essay Limit Play, Fan Authorship Between Source Text, Intertext and Context by Stein and Bussey, 2009, they argue that fandoms are interpretive communities defined by shared readings of a character, a pairing, or a particular aspect of a fictional universe. It's not the truth of a cultural object that matters, but the collective truth that arises from consensus of interpretation. There's no right or wrong answer about what an idea is or could be in fandom. If you interpret something differently, you can join the people who think the way that you do. Internet fandom runs on a practice of speedrunning herbmanautic schisms. Meanwhile, over on TikTok, the world of doubloons is emerging. I personally find it less interesting than loot, but both share similar DNA, generic sword and sorcery tropes, fueling roleplay potential. As I said on Twitter, the most interesting thing about doubloons is the hijack of TikTok's algorithmic feed as a roleplay game mechanic in order to generate random encounters. The navigation of the world of doubloons via TikTok's platform physics is, however, intriguing from a world-running perspective. You can only interact with the world of the game by encountering other players. There's no way of seeing the game space in its totality. You can only play with other people who are playing. Speaking of which, I just lost the game. Doubloons is still in the active process of being welded, created collectively by interpretive reactions to prompts created by other players, but it lacks rules, which is why IMO permissive Web3 IPs are more interesting. Speaking of tokens, many articles about doubloons has focused on its economy crashing. Doubloon players have run into the same problem as the granddaddy of interpretive communities did in the 1970s. In The Elusive Shift, John Peterson talks about the problem of experience point inflation in Dungeons & Dragons, and the question of whether XP was transferable across gaming groups. Arguments raged between level 250 mages and lower level players with more modest, less generous DMs. This began to threaten the social cohesion of players across the country. One letter to a D&D fanzine described players with unchecked XP as 
gross. Loot and doubloons represent two sides of the same problem Gygax faced in 1976. Either a trusted ledger, loot was required to log XP, or accommodations for higher level players, doubloons was required in the game's rule set. What's next for the doubloon player base is not whether they can continue to interpret the rules of the world that they are collectively worlding, but instead coordinate to fix them.